All right, so welcome back to High Performance Computing, our lecture seven on deep learning, already the second part. And this, the first part really was, let's say, a very fast introduction to machine learning, admittedly. So we looked on some very easy binary classification with a linear perceptron model, so essentially a line in space telling us between data items, is it the iris setosa, iris virginica, is it flower A or flower B? A very simple, trivial problem but captures the essence of machine learning very well. It's actually a model that was developed in the 50s, the artificial neuron, so to speak, called the perceptron, with many limitations, right? So with this, you cannot really do so much in practice, especially if you have, let's say, multi-class classification. You have to add on different elements, and that's what we have done. They have the multi-output perceptron. We extended this, let's say, principal model a little bit with having 10 outcomes, for instance, to solving this handwritten character recognition set, right? So this zero to nine classification, this was quite important. But also there we saw that basically this model now added on with some optimization can perform quite well on this very trivial problem. But this was only the start of extending it. Now how you really extend it is thinking about what also the video was alluding to, adding more and more of these hidden layers, right? And then with this also many, many neurons in it. In other words, you combine this very trivial perceptron learning model that we had in the beginning with adding much, much more of them and interconnect them. That's an important part of it. They're not standalone in parallel. They're all interconnected. And secondly, introducing non-linearities, not only having this linear decision boundary, plus one flower, minus one other flower. There we have a smooth, let's say, function, or as you have seen, in the rectified linear unit is quite interesting for negative values, always zero, and just positive is giving you a signal. Um, maybe sounds a bit like learning good. You should not learn from the negative, but should learn just from the positive. Um, but this is something which is more or less an intuition. We also learned that the trainable parameters with this grow significantly if you have the neural network already, which was a growth from, let's say, 8,000 up to 120,000 trainable parameters, which all have a computational footprint. Once you do this, you will realize you never come to the model directly firsthand. You have to do it again and again and again, changing SGD to Adam, changing the number of neurons in the hidden layer. These are all so-called hyperparameters, which we as humans pick and having no idea if that's a good idea, right? So this is flexibility for us. And the hyperparameter optimization tools, we maybe come in this lecture to have an invitation from Marcel. I thought about this maybe at the, towards the end of the lecture. Um, one of my PhDs who is doing hyperparameter optimization, HPC, he can tell you a little bit about how often you have run have to run these models to make it really perfect, right? Because humans just pick these pieces but have no idea which are the good number of neurons. But their principal frameworks like Raytune, Optuna, uh, which can help you pick this. But it takes, of course, many, many HPC runs in order to get to the good results of the A model. Hence, even more computational footprint. Now, in the second part, we will extend this and now introduce something really what is deep learning. So in a way, the first part was just an introduction to get to the thinking of deep learning, adding more layers, making it deeper. But also in front, I would say always a kind of warning when we talk about deep learning, don't think just about deep learning means adding a lot of layers and then be happy. That's why I brought this um, slide. I think it captures the success of deep learning tremendously because behind each of those, you will find different deep learning models. What I will show you is just the convolutional networks used for image recognition. What you find here is basically different ideas how you do this. Here, there could be still convolutional neural network models behind it. There are recurrent structures. Here, we see sequence structures and fluid gas dynamics, already alluding a little bit to Razor's part, uh, where long short term memory is used to basically learn from physics to do physics, right? So how basically the, the smoke in the room will evolve based on AI instead of the, the function that we would have uh, in simulation sciences, as we called it, with num perhaps numerical methods over time based on known physical laws, how you can see how the smoke evolves. But here people have learned, it's actually from TUM in Munich, um, have learned basically how actually physical phenomena can be learned by AI. And this is a complete different structure that you see in my basically CNN that I had before with the CNN 
in the um, uh, in the INN that we had basically for the character recognition set. And you go on and go on. The, you have probably heard from AlphaGo, some of you, the success of AI, beating one of the world champions. I think this has also different structure with recurrent structures again and so on. You go on and go on. Protein folding has used the idea of the game for basically alpha fold and were successful in protein folding. So wherever you go, um, the success relies in the computational footprint. So we have no GPUs. We can have very large models, deep models. But don't think about deep as just adding another hidden layer, another hidden layer, another hidden layer than we learned before. Right, so usually these la layers are loaded. They are very specific for very specific problems. They are stacked up on very different parts. The key essence is still I put different neurons in these layers, but I arrange them in different pieces. And this is an important factor also in the success of deep learning. It's not only the computational footprint. And I think the success of deep learning is best expressed in getting, so to speak, the Nobel Prize in Computer Science, which went 2018 with a Turing Award to the inventors of deep learning. Um, if you remember, one of the recent one was Jack Dongara, which is actually one of the birth fathers of HPC. So he's very renowned in our community, uh, very senior. So he got also the award. And uh, I bring here different pieces together on this slide that I went showed in the German parliament, actually, as an task of indicating HPC, cloud computing, big data, and machine and deep learning on one slide for politicians in three minutes. So I ended up with this one and got a kind of good feedback on this um, to bring all these buzzwords together, if you want, right? So if you think that you have some data where all starts from, you have essentially the idea of big data going larger and larger, where basically the kind of traditional models when you have, let's say, support vector machines, random forests, we call that shallow learning. So basically still work enough to a certain extent when some certain packages will break. Essentially, they will not fit into memory anymore, the whole the data. So you have to go parallel. And still, when you have, let's say, not so much big data, these shallow models that you see here have very good performance and you would not go for deep learning. That's an important part here in the slide. You only can do deep learning if you basically swim in data, right? That's a very important for the ingredient. Um, you see small neural networks, what we saw here, the, the kind of two layer ones. Um, this is something where you say, okay, it starts there with, because also here we seeing more and more computational footprints. So this red part means the computing footprint is quite intense, more and more. The more you do deep learning, from data, which is big and large data sets, the more accuracy you get is definitely much better performance. Every deep learning network today beats everything in computer vision if there's enough deep learning data, but you pay the price for it, right? The training for it, the hyperparameter optimization for it with all the different deep networks basically pays then um, quite a, a significant amount of computing footprint. And this is essentially bringing all of these worlds together if you don't swim in big data, don't go for deep learning. Just go to shallow learning models. They will do still a very good job. If you swim in data and you have computational power, then deep learning is the, basically the recipe um, today. And yeah, this basically concludes a little bit the slide, which is one summary of all the different buzzwords and the kind of justification why we need high performance computing. I showed this example a couple of times here. We see kind of different layers, if you remember. It summarizes also what we basically have learned in the first lecture today. The perceptron model, if you remember, directly connections, uh, no hidden layers, um, just directly deciding are we going to essentially a number here and there. And now the difference to this kind of multi-layer um, perception, the MLP or the neural network was really introducing now essentially this different layer structure, which you see in the video coming up. So hence, in a way, you would suggest we go deeper in the amount of neurons, right? Because here, just one level of neurons. Now I add basically another level of neurons. It is basically nice shown here in the, in the kind of web introducing two middle layers and then the last layer, which is always there for a classification. 
um, going down basically then again to um, a softmax classifier where the probabilities are then broken down to one of these classes. And it, now it suggests that you would carry on like this. You would say, well, then for deep learning, you just do another layer and another layer, another layer, nothing changes. It must be every, always better performance. That's not the case. It will fail, right? And that's why the convolutional networks that I will present here a little bit and talk about it a little bit have a complete different approach. It still talks about neurons in different layers, but as you see with feature maps here, it tries to carve out features which are local. We will talk about this, weight sharing concepts, which are not in the normal artificial neural network you have seen here, right? So this is a very specific way how you arrange the deep layers. You see that essentially here, putting feature learning before you do the classification, right? In former times, and I stopped the video here a little bit, the spiking networks are a little bit the future and not part of the course today. But you see that a little bit here again, um, that's what we want to talk about today, the feature extraction part, right? This is makes deep learning successful. And this is similar in also other deep learning networks. This is one for vision, the CNN convolution network doing convolution operations here, different feature maps to break down a big problem like recognizing a three in different features that then are smaller, broken into different edges, corners, round elements of an image in order then to help the classifier to recognize it's a three, that's an eight, and so on. So this is how it's done, learning again, again and again from this, but don't think about it just putting neurons there. There's a really high success more in this very specific networks. And you see that how well that even works by doing feature learning that even if parts of the image are basically distracted or not at the same position, um, you see here essentially a face is learned in the eyes area and noses, that's a feature map for this part, right? It breaks down the images in features. And that's what we not done before. <clears throat> what we done basically in traditional machine learning or where, for instance, Gabriel, when he did the PhD at my, uh, in my uh, time, you know, it, uh, when I was a supervisor with him, he created his whole PhD thesis just on features and generating features to do classification and remote sensing. Then deep learning come into play. And that means all the features generation, this feature learning suddenly was automated as part of the modeling. And this is now the benefit of it in many cases because the human mind is quite, let's say, restricted in putting these features, not only in time and space, but also in the number of approaches and perhaps biased. So to automate the feature learning, which is then this part, still the general idea with weights is there. We're learning still all the weights that you see here in the feature extraction part. And basically then the classification part was a fully connected net. But basically you see that we don't really go into different parts of, um, let's say modifying the image significantly. We just throw the image in. And that's what we will also later do in the source code with the MNIST. Now, still, you would say, then I have a feature, perfect recognition, it must be 100%. And here's the example why that never can be also true. You see some of the examples here in the middle, um, maybe also should do this here for the online audience a little bit. These are basically characters that is almost not learnable from. They would have some label, probably a zero, or could that be an eight? This might be a nine, but who knows? So there are probably some examples which never really gives us a 100% performance. And this is something what we already learned. So let's dive deeper into this, right? So when I talked about you giving the whole image, I have maybe my character from 28 by 28 pixels that I put just in like that. Hence, I don't vectorize anymore, right? You remember we had this very long array with 700 something elements. Now I just take the 28 by 28 pixels. What I win from this is this local connectivity or the kind of idea how we as humans also actually recognize features. We don't look at a cow and have the whole cow in front of us. We see the cow in terms of black and white parts on the cow and then actually translate this must be a cow in the bigger space. The same with a car. We recognize a car not because of the whole car. We recognize it in tires and other parts of the car. So this is basically exactly like the human um, is doing in the perception, much more the job of recognizing something. But this means a lot of um, input signals. Hence, our brain has understood to reduce significantly layer by layer, right? 
and otherwise we would be overwhelmed by the signals. Hence, this local connectivity to keep all these features, if you want, on one part of the image together will be basically part of the next layer. With this, you basically slide then over the image uh, with a certain sliding window in order to recognize the same image and then apply the so-called convolution operation. So this brings you a feature map. And here's a very trivial example where you see this cross maybe here in the filter that you put in. There's always a times one and a cross. And when I do this cross and go over it, only there where, let's say, times one in the cross, I will then actually use the values which are there in the image and then come to this convolved feature. So I, I slide this here over this. We'll create this kind of, you know, using the filter to create this kind of convolved feature map. But I don't do it once. I do it several times to have different feature maps in parallel, right? And this means, on the one hand, I keep the weight sharing. That means for every time I slide over this, I keep the weight that is basically connecting them. And this will be a key to understand that no matter where the eyes and ears or face parts of the human are, I can still recognize this feature, right? Wherever it is in the image, because it's the same weight, the same thing I learn basically in this particular feature. And you see how that works with a big input. We always reduce it. And this is something what we can define this five times five sliding window. Everything is our hyperparameter again that we can modify, hence retrain, relearn. So in this filters will be now the key and this kind of convolution operations to go deeper and deeper by the same time reducing the data more and more um, that we see perhaps also on the next slide. Important, however, is on this that you understand a little bit this part here on the bottom right. With a convolved feature, I take this filter, slide it over this in order to always reduce significantly the pixels as well, right? All these nine signals here are reduced basically then always to one in this particular next convolved feature. And with this, over time and time, I reduce the overall space of the data, but also come to more precise ideas what the feature look like. Another representation perhaps here if you want in the RGB field, if you have a three dimensional input, a typical image, right? This RGB encoded, for example, like a car. You go over this and you would have some filter that you go over is with certain weights. And you see here nicely that the weights are shared. Now I have another kind of idea of doing another feature map and go again with another filter over it. And then you can basically steer the number of features you want to see in the feature map, right? It doesn't have to be two. You can have three as in this image, et cetera. Then what usually happens is something, we have still a very high representation of the input space. And every weight, if you know, costs hell a lot of computing time to train, still using the same context with error back propagation. Um, the problem you run into is like very heavy computation. So hence you do some pooling steps in between to reduce again the size, things like max pooling, average pooling of the whole pixel to reduce again the size of basically the convolve feature. And I will show you an example how that works uh, in a minute based on this MNIST. And you have a visual representation of that exactly. What is usually very clear at the end is still basically the classification output. We have a softmax layer putting in probabilities after a fully distributed, uh, fully connected network, a dense layer. And then it will recognize the different classes like here, car, truck, van, bicycle, almost like our digits from zero to nine. Hence, I would have still this 10 outputs classifying me this kind of images. And here you see one operation of this pooling, the max pooling on the bottom right is an example, could be average pooling. Max pooling is quite often used. It says something like the strongest signal survives, you know, like in nature, so to speak. So you would say this is maybe something where the pixel should be rep represented. The way how you do the feature learning could be now adding again and again, essentially these layers, right? But they are usually, and that's the difference to the thing we learned before with the different neurons. I would always put different layers, but I would arrange them the same way. A convolution operation, a non-linearity like rectified linear unit and pooling it. Then again, convolution, rectified linear unit, pooling it. So you don't put just neurons making it deeper, 
you have a very systematic way of constructing this. That's why people say uh, network architectures to it. So people have really developed this and thinking a little bit about the problem at hand to build this. Here's a tool that I want to show you a little bit, and you're, of course, welcome to play around with this a little bit. It's a website that I think is beautiful. It shows you here a very nice way of visualizing this. And there's several different visualizers. You could have a 3D fully connected network, a 3D convolutional network. Um, you have a 2D connected network. Um, let's say for our purpose here today, the 2D is maybe enough to understand. So that what I just talked to you in the slide is better represented. So you see here the input space. And when I say now there's an eight, let's see how good I am in painting today. Whoop. Now we can see how that works. We give this in, and then the first kind of layer is just always having this weight sharing to detect more and more this kind of pixeling, pixel by pixel going through and creating the next image. This will be further reduced again to the next image. Again, you have a kind of sliding window, and you have this kind of number of neurons that you see sometimes sliding here, which shows you the weight sharing, right? All of these weights are shared. And this is just the first layer. Then we go deeper and you see also with the pooling, how we come smaller and smaller to the sizes. But having this different feature maps also means we have different varieties of the eight now. How people write differently the eight, you see this more and low in this kind of shadow representation here, become smaller and smaller in the features almost to something which for us humans doesn't make any sense anymore. But these are parts of eights. Right now, the interesting thing, as these are features, the smaller we go, these features will pop up in other images which are not an eight. Right, and you see this well represented by the three here. As I told you, the last layers are always fully connected. You see this here in this two, and then there will be a soft max layer that basically now would keep the strongest signal. But we see also the strongest signal is maybe the eight but it's still a catch of probabilities. So it would say maybe 80% is eight, but it could be also 10% three. And why? Someone has an idea? <laughs> That's a good point. As I see here, it says first guess is three, um, second guess is eight, but it could be the way how I write it. Um, good point. But basically, normally you would say it should be that three has a very high overlap with the eight, right? So you see now first guess is eight, but you see also the second guess with zero is now, um, you know, when you now extend it, it would be just like this, right? And this is capturing a little bit the essence, what, what is now happening in the feature learning because the features are almost the same, right? It just lacks a little bit the inner part now that is not recognized. But here, that's why we are so close with the eight and the three uh, and the zero, we come probably also to some combinations where the three would be very kind of certain. Maybe maybe paint something like this. I'm not good at this. Uh, now it's a six, maybe almost, depending on how many samples have been learned. This is basically the majority where it learned from that this is looking more or less low. People write a six and broken down in all the different features. Right, because these features will pop up again and again. And of course, you can basically hide here several layers. You see here downsampling layers, um, hide them uh, to make some points where you basically have the most convolutional operations or something like this. So I invite you to play with it. I put the link online, but it's also a part of my slides. And it's just interesting to just, you know, see a little bit how that works also for other numbers with a one or so. Um, where you would say, okay, of course, it has some features of the seven as well, right? You would say, first guess is a seven. I would say, for me, it's maybe a one, but it could be how... You also have to see, we have this location invariance, right? We always have to see the image. Deep learning is not operating on this. It's operating 365 degrees. And indeed, when you see it a little bit like, you know, going to the right angle, it is actually looking more like a seven, like a one. So this is another part of this feature, say occasionally having this location invariance and also rotation invariance, which making them also so successful. And we can play around and play around, but I think it's fun if you want to do it yourself to really see how that works. 
<clears throat> now when we want to code it, it's actually not that complicated. So when you do it and go basically back, we have basically Keras, where we still have the idea of a sequential approach. We add layer by layer, but now, as you know, we don't eat anymore here directly, need a kind of dense one, only later for basically the classification part. For the feature part, we have the convolutional 2D, and then basically have, again, this nonlinear activation function. We have to specify the kernel size. That is basically the filter you have seen going over to convolve the features. Then we have basically the padding. If it basically doesn't fit to the image, what happens to the surroundings? Let's say a smaller modification, which are not important for you to know here in the course right now. Um, we want to come to the computational aspects for it because we're in a HPC course not in a machine learning course, but here we have a nonlinear activation function, rectified linear unit, and this pooling I was alluding to. Essentially what you see here, right? We put a kind of feature match generation, then we pool and have the convolution operation again. So that means we have another layer, as you see here, with a convolution again. This time we want to have actually much more feature maps, right? To carve out more features of the image. So we say 50, and then again, the same concept, pooling, convolution operation, et cetera. What missing here is a little bit the nonlinearity. Everywhere we see the kind of activation function ReLU, which is basically put there. Could be another one, right? There are other activation functions we talked about. But these days, here and there, the rectified linear unit is quite good. Then flattening out is meaning essentially the part which I was alluding before here is feature learning. Now we have all the features and we know when they fire, right? When they are detected in the input image, then they fire and will inform the dense layer here. And by learning then over time this, when they basically fire this feature in this kind of two layer network, they will learn what is the output of this image. That's why the lower, the, la the last one of the output is still 10, right? Because we have 10 digits. In this sense, it's basically more and more feature learning. And just at the end, we have a dense network, which is quite powerful with 500, right? So quite lots of connections to learn a lot. And the softmax probability layer will be then putting it into probabilities again to learn. Well, it's saying what you saw at the very top of this basically uh, interesting website. Uh, it's a zero, seven, it's an eight, it's a nine, whatever. Now, more importantly for us here in the course is the amount of parameters. Right, we have seen now something from 8,000 in the beginning up to basically 120,000 for artificial neural network to layer up to now 1.2 million trainable parameters, even with weight sharing, right? So the interesting thing is that in order to create these feature maps, every one of those has the same filter, the same weights. But because I have so many of them and because I go so deep in them, I have more and more of this trainable parameters. And this means lots of lots of computation. When you put that to a CPU, it will basically have a very hard time to operate on this. So neural network will just work. The perceptron of course is very simple, but this will take a long, long time. So you basically can put it on and then take your tea, take your coffee. And then in a couple of hours you come back and maybe it has trained a lot. Because the trainable parameters are so high, what I told you before, there's lots of hyperparameters in this. Nobody told you that we should use 50 feature maps or 20 feature maps. That's an intuition, right? So something like 20 might be useful because they're 10 digits. They might be inverted, so it makes them 20 digits, something like this. So let's go for 20 features. But the way how you do it systematically is not explainable. So you have a hyperparameter optimization engine, again, testing this for you, making this one training, a next training, a next training, a next training with different hyperparameters. Again, basically bring you to the point that HPC is really needed. Different GPUs are needed in order to speed up this problem so that it also comes out, let's say, in a minute. Right. So this is the key to understand the relationship to HPC, why it's needed, why GPUs are needed. We talked about in lecture six that all of these are very simple operations. Right. What we have seen with the filter, it's like basically matrix, matrix multiplication, if you want, very simple. But you have let's awful lots of many of them, and that is beautiful for the GPU. So GPU itself can do it with the many core processor very quickly, even if it's a moderate speed processor. But the benefit is because there's so many at the same time, it can do this massively parallel. 
And as I said, then uh, one topic that will come at some point, maybe an invited lecture from Rocco, we have to see, or maybe by part of you, will be this distributed deep learning where I will talk a little bit by that you can also now this training branch up into different GPUs, not only one GPU. Right, towards the end here, a little bit, uh, you know, the source code again, thinking about what we want to have out is the accuracy, right? If you remember, and what would us give the accuracy if we execute this 99%. Right, so almost everything correct. As we know, there would be some fellows we never learn, but this is basically cutting edge uh, deep learning, if you want, with one specific model. And Razor will then have, of course, different models to talk about. And you see how basically deep learning improved, even in this little toy example, significantly, but you have to pay the price for it. You Basically, you cannot use CPUs anymore in order to do deep learning. And that's all I leave you on the table for you. Um, there's this kind of interesting video that I will not play now. It's four or five minutes, but it captures nicely the essence of, I think, also involving overfitting, underfitting, why basically this nonlinear space is very important and so forth. And you see also nicely here in this picture already the 20 hidden units. That means just adding more and more neural networks is also, you know, basically alluding to lots of overfitting chances are that the next point is misclassified. So these are topics in a machine learning course you have to study much more in depth. But here we leave it as this because we have a HPC course. And I would say thank you very much for joining the course. I will see you back, I think, towards the end of the course. I will hand over now to Razor because I have to do much more research projects. But yeah, I'm basically in range. So see you next time. <laughs>